So facsimile number two we get to talk about. This is an amazing picture that uh, Joseph Smith has given us from the Joseph Smith papyri. Um, <clears throat> lots of cool things to understand about this. So uh, to begin, we want to understand facsimile number two is the circular uh, image that we have in the book of Abraham. This is actually called a hypocephalus. It is a type of of uh, writing, I guess, if you will, that is not uncommon. It's quite common in Egypt. There's hundreds of these hypocephalus that have been found all over the place in archaeological research uh, throughout uh, Egypt. <clears throat> so just to give you some ideas, okay, the point of this hypocephalus uh, is to teach you things, to help you out. The uh, Egyptians really strongly believed in life after death and resurrection. So they believed that when you die, there are angels who stand at guard in the gates of heaven. And if you want to get in to heaven, then you need to know certain key words and tokens and signs to help you to get past those angels so that you can get into heaven. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the point of the hypocephalus, as well as the book of the dead, uh, is to actually teach you the things that you need to know to pass by those angels so that you can return to heaven to live with the gods, basically. So the hypocephalus, sometimes it's in a tablet, like a, like a clay tablet form. It was used kind of behind the head of the mummies. <clears throat> and so in, in the idea of thinking about that, taking that wisdom with them, Sometimes it was in papyrus, like in the, in the case of the Joseph Smith papyrus, it was an image in the papyrus that they had at the time. So it wasn't like a stone tablet or something like that. Uh, but they find lots of different copies of these. Uh, they were usually custom made to the person who was being involved, the, the dead person. So <clears throat> we're going to learn a lot about this and who this hypocephalus was made for and uh, more about what's going on with these and the different facts and figures and things. Now, this hypocephalus uh, talks a lot about different concepts and ideas. They incorporate a tremendous amount of information here about the afterlife, about heaven, about earth, about other things, okay? Uh, that's really cool. Even, even through time, they give you some ideas of how they have arranged things. So we'll talk about some of these things as well. Uh, in a way, it's not unlike the Mayan calendar in how it's it's set up and how it's organized. So there's a lot of cool similarities there. So <clears throat> let's get in and talk about this a little bit more. Now, Hugh Nibley in his book, uh, One Eternal Round, has several things that he, he talks about with this. He says the hypocephalus itself is the iris of his eye, surrounded by the rim as the waters of none. And that the theme of the hypocephalus is the creation drama. So in a way, how this is set up is kind of like the eye of Iris uh, to, to teach you, to give you wisdom and to look into the past, if you will, to talk about creation and the beginning of, of everything. He also said the hypocephalus is similar to the mind calendar. They deal with space and time. It has been designated by various scholars as serving various but related purposes. It is a passport, a certificate, a travel guide, a roadmap, a ticket, and so forth. So again, the point of the hypocephalus is to give you the information to help you through to the next life. So it teaches you and puts things in context and in, in timing and everything else to understand this life and the next life, basically. <clears throat> so another one he says here is another tie with the hypocephalus is the Book of the Dead. Uh, 161, in fact, closely related to the Book of the Dead, 162, the handbook to the hypocephalus. Now, the Book of the Dead, 161, begins with a strange and enigmatic invocation, quote, may Ra live in the turtle and the turtle die, uh, unquote, which cry is repeated four times in each of the four directions and addressed to each of the four winds. A cosmic connection is clearly implied. So there's a lot of, again, connections between earth and heaven and this life and the next life. A lot of different levels of information, things that happen on this hypocephalus. And not, like I said, not everyone is the exact same. 
Uh, there are some that match that are out there that match the Joseph Smith papyri one. Uh, but some of the, most of the slots are usually pretty similar, but some of the slots are a little different with some of their information. Um, <clears throat> now here's something that was interesting that Shinobi said as well. Uh, also in his book, uh, One Eternal Round, he says, lacking the original, we have no evidence that the Joseph Smith hypocephalus was actually placed under the head of its owner. Though the hypocephalus was curiously examined by hundreds of observers to the Nauvoo house, no one ever mentions what would have been its most striking feature, its platter-like composition. Apparently, it was a drawn, it was drawn on a papyrus, just like the other sketches that go with it. There is significantly no mention on the Joseph Smith hypocephalus of providing heat under the head. It would seem to be first and last a diadetic astronomical chart. Didactic astronomical chart, excuse me, which is how Joseph Smith treats it. So again, we there's no one, there's no information going. Oh, look at this clay tablet that was you that was underneath the head of the mummy. Nobody ever mentions that or talks about it or how this is this round clay tablet. So they they say the only thing that they know of is these papyrus writings were in with the mummy, and so this hypocephalus was there. And since this one has come forward. There have been other ones found where they was written in the papyri, not just a clay tablet. Uh, another quote, he says, Yet another progression is the three degrees of glory with prelude and postlude phone shown on facsimile two. Now, from the eternal background, figure one, to the glory of the sun at the zenith, figure two, to the glory of the moon, figure three, the glory of the stars, the Kabasu, figure four, and so down to earth with figures five, six, and seven. So he, he nearly is talking about how there is a way you can see a progression between three degrees of glory in this hypocephalus. And, and talk about the, again, heaven and sun and earth and those relationships. Uh, so he, he nearly had a comment here to tie all three facsimiles together. It's a really great comment he made. He says, as our story began, with the dismal scene of facsimile one, which remember is Abraham being sacrificed uh, to, to a god, it ends in glory and triumph with facsimile three. Plainly, facsimile two in some way expedites travel between the two. So again, showing how, you know, facsimile one, Abraham is being, uh, they're trying to kill him, sacrifice him, so it's a really bad situation. Facsimile 2 is more about a journey back to God, and then Facsimile 3 shows him on the throne. So in a way, symbolically, it, all three together kind of show a progression that we go through. Another comment he really made about this uh, Facsimile number 2 shows, really, when you look at how this is laid out, that it shows that God is everywhere in our lives and in every aspect of everything that we have and experience. So another cool lesson we get to learn from this hypocephalus. <clears throat> so let's talk just a little bit more about the hypocephalus or hypocephali for plural uh, to understand this, this type of writing or this type of format a little bit deeper. Uh, and this is, let me see, I believe this is another quote from Hugh Nibley. Yes, when I turn around, he has quite a bit about this one. Uh, he says, hypocephali as such are singular documents. To, to recapitulate briefly, one, there are a little more than a hundred surviving from a period of 500 years. <clears throat> Number two, they were private and intimate documents belonging to a very limited social class, families of priests and priestesses of Amun-Ra. Three, they were designated uh, or designed, excuse me, to the personal taste and often by the hand of the owner who, quote, passed the practice down from father to son. Four, they are found in few places, notably Thebes and Tel El Yahudia, which is the Jewish settlement. So they're they're not just ubiquitous for everybody that's out there, but the, the hypocephalus is something that tends to come from priests uh, or more of the wealthy class area that they would utilize these uh, these uh, writings. And it's fascinating that even some of the Jewish settlements in Egypt is where they find some of these as well. So there's, I think there's some good tie-ins with Old Testament ideas and how those connect over. Uh, <clears throat> he says, there are certain features which set the Joseph Smith hypocephalus apart from all the rest, including interesting trivia such as that, one, it has been until recently the only hypocephalus in the Western Hemisphere, recently meaning around the 1950s and 60s. 
In fact, its implausible appearance on the Western frontier in 1835 is quite surprising and has been noted by some writers on the subject. Then again, number two, the second reason, it is the first hypocephalus ever to be published and interpreted. So this is not a type of document that they even knew about back in Joseph Smith's day. Egyptology was literally just starting back then. And so when his hypocephalus came out, it was, it was basically the first one that they had ever discovered. And so they didn't know what to do with this. Uh, but Joseph Smith was able to translate, translate it, basically. Uh, the next, the second publication was the Florence Hypocephalus, which, although the mummy was unrolled in September 1827, was not published until 1855. Now, Samuel Birch takes due notice at the time of the Joseph Smith Hypocephalus, but protests that, quote, the inscription is so badly engraved that it is impossible to make out its meaning, and Smith's interpretation throws no light upon it. <clears throat> yeah, some people want to want to dog on what Joseph Smith has done about this, but there's a tremendous amount of uh, information we have today that corroborates Joseph's interpretation. Now, the third reason is in the mid 19th century, some scholars were quite excited about hypocephali, but suddenly lost interest between 1896 and 1942. There were only four publications dealing with the hypocephali. Hence, of all the hypocephali, the Joseph Smith one alone has been sub the subject of serious contemplation through the years. The authorities of the church have wisely abstained from you issuing any statements on the interpretation of the facsimiles. The book of Abraham still awaits further revelation with strict limitations for the present. Quote, writings that cannot be revealed into the world, that's figure eight. Uh, things that ought not to be revealed, that's figure nine. Things which will be given in the undue tide of the Lord, figure 12 to 21. Others are to be had in the in the Holy Temple, that's figure eight. Meantime, if the world can find out these numbers, so let it be, amen, that's figure 11. So some things they we know about, but haven't been necessarily publicized that much. <clears throat> figure Now, the, the fourth reason that Joseph Smith hy hypocephali is such a unique one, that Joseph Smith hypocephalus is the only one whose owner bears a pharaonic name, Sheshonk, Solomon's father-in-law the only pharaoh named in the Bible and the one most closely associated with Israel. And the fifth reason is the frequent reference to Heliopolis on the Joseph Smith hypocephalus ties it to the headquarters of the Jews in Egypt. Number six, in fact, a special oddity about the Joseph Smith hypocephalus is that for all the hundreds of curious viewers who examined it in Kirtland and Nauvoo, no one has ever described it as a separate disc, cushion, or anything but a regular drawing on papyrus. What should have been its most striking feature is never mentioned. It contains no mention of the standard function of the hypocephalus as a cushion under the head or headrest to supply warmth or flame for the head. Thus, the Florence papyrus was found over the head between the protecting cowl and the body of the mummy and is compared with another hypocephalus which was above the occiput. Occiput, excuse me. There is no hint of this feature in the Joseph Smith hypocephalus. It is, in particular, a cosmographical chart. From all this, we may infer that its purpose was that of many other objects similar to the hypocephalus, which is to aid the student in the well-known preoccupation of Abraham, the study of the cosmos, the creation, and the place of man in it. So there's just tons of information that we can learn about this. The point of this, it's, it's basically they're trying to say, if we had to put on one piece of paper all the key important principles that you need to learn and understand and use a writing that uses more pictures to represent sounds as well and pictures to represent concepts and ideas, this is what you get. This is the hypocephalus saying, okay, this is what you, as you die, you need to take this knowledge with you to the next life. And so we're going to put these in with your coffin so that you can, your sarcophagus basically, so that you can take them with you. And when you come get your body, they're here. You can remind yourself of all the things you need to remember so that you can get into heaven and pass those angels who stand as sentinel. So tremendous stuff. In fact, if you want um, in Hugh Nibley's book, One or Turn Around, there's an entire chapter on the hypocephalus. Uh, and he goes into a lot of detail on the Mayan calendar and a lot of similarities and things way more than we want to put in in notes inside the scriptures here 
So if you want to dig even deeper, that is a great place to go. I do have a lot of notes and things in here from it, but uh, most of it is, there's still more over in that chapter. So he has a whole chapter on the hypocephalus in his book, One Eternal Round. I believe that is volume 19 of the collected works of Hugh Nibley. Uh, he says in here as well, um, uh, the important relevance of the Hebrew records to our facts only two is the Egyptian background of both of them. Kohler and Ginsberg saw the clear Egyptian background of the Sefer Yetzirah, uh, which is a Jewish document. That pseudo Eupolemus reports that Abraham lived with the Egyptian priests in Heliopolis, teaching them many things, and he introduced astrology and other sciences to them, saying that the Babylonians and he himself had discovered them, but he traced the discovery to Enoch. Uh, Artapanus reports that Abraham went together with his whole family to Phraethon, the king of the Egyptians, and taught him astrology. So a lot of great things that we can see in there. Uh, there's just so much here that's, that's just amazing. Uh, in fact, a couple of the sim some of the symbolism of the hypocephalus here. He says, first of all, it is round. The universal concept of completeness. Specifically, it represents what is generally agreed upon as the pupil of an eye, a theme deserving special attention. Almost all hypocephali are divided into three horizontal divisions recognized by the figures in them as solar, lunar, and chthonian. Even on first inspection, certain aspects of the hypocephalus suggest the obvious situation stated by Dehorak in 1862 and 1884 and never seriously challenged, meaning the circle is divided to represent the two celestial hemispheres. The human cycle is thus continually compared to that of the solar star, the various phases being personified by divine types. Scenes portrayed on these discs relate in all their details to the resurrection and the renewed birth after death, symbolized by the course of the sun, the living image of divine generation, all these different symbols represent on the one side the female and the other side the male element to express the idea of eternal generative power. The lower part of the circle represents the lower or dark hemisphere from whence the sun was supposed to have come forth to mark the beginning of time. The mystical eye, called Uza, conveys the idea of the renewal of a period like the full moon, the solstice, the equinoxes, etc., and it designates here the accomplishment of the period of resurrection, always assimilated with the daily and annual revival of the sun. Here we have that association of the hypocephalus and the temple, which prevails throughout the study of facsimile too. But before proceeding, we should note that a number of such cosmic charts are found in the ancient world. One thinks of the enormous star ceiling at Dendera and the great Hopi seasonal glyphs but none is more challenging than the famous Aztec calendar stone, too closely resembling the Joseph Smith hypocephalus to be ignored, as it has been described by Nelia, Zelia Natal. So just some fascinating stuff that we can get here. Even the shape of the facsimile has symbolism to it. It means things. One eternal round, that's an important point of, of seasons, of circular, of renewing, regeneration, coming back around, uh, the eye, seeing things, visions, uh, separating it out into the different sections. So amazing that there's there's nothing that was put in here that wasn't meant to be here. Not an accident why it's separated out and set up the way, way we have it. Uh, something that's interesting about this, in fact, that he talks about is when we discussed figure three, okay, figure three is in that upper right corner that shows the, the person on the uh, um, boat. He says, we referred to the drawing in the church historian's office, which was done after the original had suffered added damage following the 1842 engraving of Reuben Headlock. Uh, so figures seven and eight were apparently still there when Headlock did his engraving. So we have to realize when, when this uh, papyrus was there, they had most of the papyrus. But then over time, it degraded. They didn't realize that the, these ancient documents, ancient papyrus would break down just with sunlight and oxygen, they could start to break down and get brittle and have problems. So some of the edges around it were cut into and lost because of that. But uh, there was a man, Reuben Headlock, and he went and actually sat down 
and basically traced out a copy of the facsimile in an effort to preserve it. So he, there were some things that he missed because they weren't there at the time when he did it, but he gave us a preservation of what was there at that time. And since then, other things have been broken down, unfortunately, as well. Uh, he says, if we start measuring the lines that form the various sections of facsimile 2, it at once becomes apparent that they are all drawn with care and the special dimensions of facsimile 2 are not duplicated in any of the hundred or so other hypocephali. So the whole, even how it's divided out, you'll find in different hypocephalus when you look them up, they are divided differently. So there's no coincidence to how this is set up. Lots of very specific thought went into how do we design these different pieces to put as much information and symbolism into this as we can to get as much information as we can to you in such a small package, basically. Uh, in fact, he says, this is a, this is circular to represent the eye or a way to get more light and get light in. So fascinating, circular with the eye to get more light in, to see more things, to learn more. Also representing the solar disk that emanates light for us, the sun, basically the solar disk, which is very important. That's what you see above uh, a lot of the times when you see the gods, the god of Ra, you'll see like a solar disk above his head in uh, hieroglyphics. So this is kind of representing the solar disk to an extent as well as that circularness to it. Uh, hypocephalus is the name given to a small disc-shaped object made of papyrus, stuccoed linen, bronze, wood, or clay, which the Egyptians place under the head of their deceased, hence the name hypocephalus, literally under the head. So hypocephalus means under the head. The purpose of the hypocephalus was to envelop the head and body in flames or radiance, thus making the deceased divine. So this is that, like that spiritual energy is supposed to come through this. The hypocephalus itself symbolized the eye of Ra or Horus, i.e. the sun, and the scenes portrayed on it relate to the resurrection of life, of life after death, which idea is more particularly symbolized by the course of the sun. The upper portion of the hypocephalus represented the day sky, the lower portion, the part with the cow, the night sky. So you can see how on the, the lower portion, all the symbols are upside down. So day and night, basically, that whole circularness. The hypocephali first appeared during the, the Sate dynasty around 663 to 525 BC. So just about, this is fascinating because the Book of Mormon starts at 600 BC, 585 BC. So this, this dynasty was around in Egypt the same time the Book of Mormon starts off, basically. And their use continued down at least to the Christian era. It is in the, in the Sate, uh, I think that's how you say it, Sate, S-A-I-T-E, Sate Recension of the Book of the Dead, chapter 162, that directions for the construction and use of the hypocephalus are given. So we actually have in the Book of the Dead, 162, we actually have the instructions in there also of how to put one together, how to make it work. Uh, this, the, the section to which this chapter belongs is found only in the late Sate version and contains many strange words and concepts. Edward Neville considers these chapters to be of foreign origin, or at least influenced by sources outside of Egypt. Uh, E.A. Wallace Budge suggests that the influence is in part Nubian. So that is, uh, this is actually some information uh, from Michael Rhodes. He did a, he did a uh, report, a translation and commentary on the Book of Abraham in the BYU Studies 1977. So they're, they're mentioning there that they added that part on, like how to do these was added on later, probably by Nubians or uh, other people that uh, were, had a strong influence in Egypt at that time. Now, the Joseph Smith hypocephalus is a circle divided by straight lines into three horizontal zones. This is how it would appear on the globe of the Earth, viewed from a position perpendicular to the polar axis. That facsimile, too, represents a globe is apparent from the fact that the figures in the lower part of the sketch are upside down to the figures in the upper, just as on the earth and those above are going to the right and those below to the left, making clear that the thing is revolving. The limitations on perspective are corrected by one endowing the central figure with four heads facing the four directions, like a Hindu temple or a Buddhist stupa. 
Also, two, the perceptive viewer would recognize the four canoptic figures in figure six as representing the four cardinal points of the earth, the four elements and colors derived from them, the four races of the earth, and later the medical alchemist's four humors of man. And third, the upper part of the hypocephalus represents the earth and sky, while the lower part, which is reversed, represents the netherworld or realm of the dead, which together depict the entire universe. So that's just fascinating how, again, how it's set up makes a huge difference. So it's sky, heaven, and the underworld are represented there. Everybody in the top is facing one way, everybody in the bottom is facing the other way. And uh, it's just amazing how much information they've put into this hypocephalus to give us different ideas. All right, continuing on, the vertical and horizontal divisions together make the familiar quadrate of the hypocephali. This is well nigh inevitable. Since the dawn of time, men have been wont to represent graphically the earth in its four quarters and the circle of the heavens in combination as a graphic expression of unity and perfection. They also symbolize the spiritual and temporal power. Uh, Seth found in the heavenly charts of Egyptians types of a common basic composition that portray the rising of the sun. He compares some 16 drawings with the sun's course in the heavens and the underworld. He notes that the Egyptians conceived of the sun as a disk floating on the primeval waters of Nun that encircled the earth, going through the sky above and also under the earth. We think at once of the rim of the hypocephalus, the earth surrounded by oceans, by Oceanus, uh, as depicted on the shield of Achilles. Seth explains that the four-sided open area within the primeval waters of Nun, in which the solar bark is depicted, is an attempt at portraying three dimensions on a two-dimensional plane, a flat projection in the manner of our modern maps. With the upside-down arrangement of the upper and lower sectors showing, as it were, the antipodes opposite the feet, or more correctly, the antikephalia opposite the head of our world. The cosmic wheel, the quadrata, and the global shape all indicate unmistakably that the structure is in motion, as we can see from the Janus-faced gods looking both ahead and behind, fitted out with striding legs and walking stick, or seated in the various solar and lunar ships cruising through the sky on the hypocephali. Also, in the Joseph Smith hypocephalus, we are faced with a process, a development, or a royal progress. For the upper part of the hypocephalus is readily recognized as celestial, and the lower part as Chthonian, of the earth, earthly. The process indicated is that of bringing life and light from the upper world to the lower world, in order to effect resurrection, our basic Ra Osiris scenario. So some just some cool ideas again about death, resurrection, the cycles of life, one eternal round, circumscribing all truth together in one great whole. They're trying to represent you know a three-dimensional perspective, but doing it with only two dimensions to work with, basically. Uh, in fact, here's another quote here: by counting the squares on ruled paper to approximate the various areas. Within facsimile 2, we can determine that the area of the lowest of the three divisions is just one-third of the whole circle, and it in turn is divided into three levels, the top one being a quarter of the area of the whole circle. The uppermost of the three main divisions is in turn divided vertically into three sections of equal area, each section being one-tenth of the whole circle. The width of the central panel is approximately two-thirds of the panels on either side of it. In the middle zone, where the central figure dominates the scene, the three panels are all equal in area, and the height of the two panels containing the Janus figures, numbers one and two, is the same. In all of this, one is free to detect resonances of the Sefer Yitzera with the dominant rule of three, as well as the favorite fraction of the Egyptians, two-thirds, being the only fraction they use which does not have one as a num numerator. We also recall the three to two relationship of male and female in Egypt, especially in the story of Joseph and Asenath and in the Kabbalah. Wolfhart Westendorf has noted that the division of the cosmos into male and female is to be taken for granted if it is to be perpetuated in what Jan Asman calls the marriage of eternity and time. The doctrine is expressed by Eric Hornung. 
quote, the beyond is also a distorted mirror image of here and now. Selim Hassan makes a similar observation. The most prominent belief was that we have a complete universe of sky and earth, which has its counterpart reversed below it. Now, in some hypocephali, the lower Chthonian or lunar section is larger than the solar. The other hypocephali are divided equally, and still others are carefully divided like the Florence hypocephalus into equal thirds, with the upper region taking up two of the thirds, however. The opposite arrangement also occurs. In a Louvre papyrus, the proportion is four up to three down. And in the British Museum, there are those with Kabbalistic proportions of three to seven and seven to three with the cow dominating. Try as one will to divide the Joseph Smith papyrus into any of the above vertical proportions, the result is frustration. The main horizontal dividers display no visible symmetry or commensurate division. One is disturbed to find not even an approximation to the other hypocephali. The disproportion is close, is positively glaring. Could it have been intentional? The first impulse for a mathematician would be to test it by the golden section or phi proportion, which is the Fibonacci series, and this operation gives an instant satisfaction. Facsimile number two sticks throughout to the sacred golden section. So even though it's the hypocephali that Joseph has, is different in, from all the other ones that are out there, here, the proportions on here actually still follow uh, the Fibonacci sequence, which is fascinating. If you're not familiar with that, well worth going in to study uh, some really cool things that you can do to learn about the Fibonacci sequence. It's really neat there. So everything in all of creation has structure. In figure one, we are as near to the, resistant, to the residence of God as we can get. Everything points to the immovable stability around which all else resolves. So let's, let's get into this and talk about figure one a little bit more uh, and just start from there and start working through these, okay? So figure one, it gives us the explanation down here. It's kolob signifying the first creation nearest to the celestial or the residence of God. First in government, the last pertaining to the measurement of time, the measurement according to celestial time, which celestial time signifies one day to a cubit. One day in Kolob is equal to a thousand years according to the measurement of this earth, which is called by the Egyptians ja o -e. Okay, so this is, this is really interesting to look at these ideas. To understand the ideas of Kolob and the creation things, go watch our Abraham, Book of Abraham videos as well to learn more there. Because I think what's fascinating about this is while they're trying to describe, you know, three-dimensional space in a two-dimensional way, most of the time we instantly think of, when we think of Kolob, uh, these ideas around uh, universe, like for the universe, like the galaxy, where we have a central planet and things revolving around it, things like that. Um, but I would say, I would challenge that and actually consider looking at it from a more quantum mechanical standpoint uh, with string theory of having multiple dimensions that instead of them ro revolving around each other, there's different dimensions that influence each other, basically. It's kind of a cool way to think about it. So, uh, this is talking more about the creation area here, like figure one, near the residence of God. Uh, he says here, the double head in facsimile two, figure one, is in fact the head of the upper standing figure, since the drawing in the church archive shows that that part of the hypocephalus was missing. In all likelihood, the figure originally had four heads, as do most hypocephali, and this is the artist's way of trying to portray four bodies seated facing outward in the four cardinal directions in a two-dimensional medium. So when you look at these, figure one, which is right in the middle, okay, this is where starting from the, just the very center of the hypocephalus, that oftentimes they, they use this head that has multiple faces on it or multiple heads together, representing the four corners of the earth, the four directions, four winds. There's usually four of them there. We have two in here, but uh, it was very likely four is what he's talking about. So now also with this, okay, because we see that that is signifying the first creations, uh, which is Kolob, basically, is figure one. Now, uh, a point here, a seated deity with two, or in most hypocephali, four ram's heads. He holds in his hand the symbols of life and dominion. So you can see the, the staffs and things he's got in his hands. And stability. So he's got three things in there. You can see them above the staff. On either side of the god are two 
synoephalic apes, numbers 22 and 23 with horned moon disks on their heads in an attitude of adoration. There are also two serpents, one either side of the seated deity. Now, I'd never thought about this, but there actually are, if you look, two little serpents, little lines kind of sticking out that aren't really connected anywhere up with the other, other symbols. Those are commonly uh, used in the hieroglyphics for snakes or serpents. Uh, this seated god represents the creator god, Knum, uh, when thus depicted with four heads, Knum united within himself the attributes of the gods, Ra, which is the sun, Shu, which is light, Geb, which is the earth, and Osiris, the afterworld. And he was considered to be the type of the primeval creative force. This four-headed version of Knum was worshipped at Mendes, Egyptian uh the the ram of the lord of jedet and he was called the ram with four faces on one neck the basic ideas apparently represented by central figures on the hypocephalus focus on the creator god his powers in life dominion and stability in much the same vein joseph smith's comments on these characters speak of the first creation God's residence, government, and measurement of time. The ideas in the two cases strike parallels if we admit life and residence as closely related concepts, dominion and government as functional equivalents, and measurements of time as presupposing some form of stability. The sinocephalic apes can represent Thoth and the moon, but due to their curious habit of watching the rising of the sun, the apes were also thought to be spirits of the dawn who were worshiping the sun at its rising. For this reason, they are often found in connection with the sun. Also, besides these solar and lunar associations, apes are found in connection with stars and constellations. Exactly what they represent here is not clear, but Joseph Smith's explanation that the two apes represent stars is not unreasonable. A scene quite similar to this is found on the obverse of the famous Meternic Stella, where eight apes are seen worshipping a seated god with four ram's heads. The god himself is encircled in a sun disc. To the left stands the ibis-headed god, Thoth, with whom, as before mentioned, the apes are often found associated. The meaning of the two snakes is harder to arrive at. Snakes were an object of both fear and reverence for the Egyptians. On the one hand, they were considered to be earth demons because of their close association with the ground, and they were avoided as much as possible. But along with this belief was the idea that snakes possessed a protective power, and for this reason they were used as amulets for the protection of houses, temples, and tombs. It is probably in this latter sense that they are used here. So they're uh, just talking about some of the different ideas, uh, how Similar they are to other hypocephalus and, and other Egyptian ideas as well. It's kind of cool. Some really neat things in there. Um, so, okay, a little bit more about... That was all from Michael, Michael Rhodes' uh, BYU Studies uh, report in 1977. So here's some more information here from Hugh Nibley. He says, figure one in the hypocephali is always identified with a moon, the hidden one. The council of the gods is here referred to as the Ennead. But as Kurt Seth noted, it has no reference whatever to the number nine, that being only something left over from the old Heliopolin Ennead. It is made clear throughout the document that the power, glory, and goodness, etc., of God are expressed in various figures. First of all, the sun, which, as in the solar Latenes, best expresses the most qualities. But with all the freedom of metaphor, one is never allowed to forget that behind all it all is a god who is real. The solar imagery recalls to us the sun god circuit to visit his various shrines as Apollo does in the Iliad. And now it goes on to say, The scepter in the grasp of our great figure one shows that he is ruling in all three worlds. It is. Is this because he himself will not separate himself from the worlds above, as his mighty crown proclaims, nor will he desert the worlds below, uh, including the this the poorest, as his thresh threefold scepter makes clear. 
to say nothing of his Anateus like wedding to the earth. So pretty fascinating. Uh, in fact, getting into the shoulders of this, this representative of the sun god, he says, most puzzling are the strange epaulets that protrude from the shoulders of the god in the Joseph Smith exemplar, which after the damage of the papyrus were also added to figure one. On some hypocephali, they look like rays of light, on some like plants, on some like jackals' heads. Some have interpreted them as feathers. They are usually so tiny as to puzzle the viewer, but there are enough of them scattered among the hypocephali to determine that they are most of the what they are most of the time. One Babylonian god who had such objects protruding from his shoulders is accompanied by a large ankh sign. The ankh sign, remember, is, it looks kind of like a cross, but the top is circular, basically. Uh, there are, in fact, many such seals in which a god wearing horns, as in facsimile 2, figures 1 and 2, has the serpent's heads extending from his shoulders, the tiny heads being crowned and displaying forked tongues in a fussy and complex design, often difficult to distinguish since they are so minute. In exactly the same way in various examples, the tiny uraeus serpents rear up on either side of the crowns worn by our Egyptian figure 2. Figure two in the other hypocephali has snakes issuing sometimes from his shoulders and sometimes from his crown, in which case his Amun crown of the two feathers was displaced by the elaborate Atef crown. More easily recognized than explained are those scenes on which the god has sun rays on his shoulders, showing him to be the sun god Shamash. In Babylonia, as in Egypt, the rays are denoted by three wavy lines shooting up from the neck and shoulders. There are many Babylonian seals in which the things are indeed plants. After careful examination, these turned out to be, in most cases, very clearly drawn bulbs of the opium poppy. Sometimes poppies and snakes issue from either shoulder together or in various combinations, both held in the hand and worn on the shoulders. Most clearly recognizable is a combination of a jackal's head beneath the feathers. This, is this to indicate passage through to the lower world, uh, Wepwawet or Anubis, and the heavenly spaces respectively? In every case, we are dealing with healing, rejuvenation, and resurrection. These ideas have often been traced to the snake's capacity to come out with a shiny new skin every year. One of the best known figures from the Gnostic mysteries is uh, Thanes encircled by a serpent. So a lot of cool things in there. Just about, I you know, never thought about the little things protruding out from his shoulders, but there's symbolism in there, something to recognize. And now let's talk about Kolob for a second here. Dinibli says, Kolob is the one name in the explanations not designated as Egyptian, and indeed it is basically Semitic, turning up with two principal meanings in the West Semitic languages, basically heart and measure referencing stars and the plumb bob to measure everything out properly starting at that point. This recalls how the Lord must constantly remind Abraham that he is seeing things only from one point of view, that his universe is only the segment he sees from the earth upon which thou standest, or simply that upon which thou standest. Uh, that's Abraham 3, 5, and 3. Nine times in one chapter he is reminded of this relativity. This also applies to time measured differently from different places and at the same time inseparably linked to space and matter, which celestial time signifies one day to a Cuban. Kurt Sieve reminds us that there are things which are opposed to our knowledge of reality as being incorrect and impossible. He warns the experts against nitpicking and micromanagement. Almost all hypocephali, while divided into distinct horizontal zones, are also marked by a strong vertical division right down the middle. This is established by the two dominant Janus figures, figures one and two, whose faces both look west and east as the Book of the Dead puts it, to yesterday and tomorrow respectively. The center line neatly divides these majestic figures as it does the two Amun feathers worn by figure two, which usually anchor the center line between them. On a number of hypocephali, the Wepwawet staff of figure two lies exactly on the center line, suggesting an intentional symbolism. It may also be significant that in the headlock engraving, the tall Amun feathers worn by figure two break through the circle into the outer space of the rim beyond, the anomalies found consistently displayed in other hypocephali. 
uh, so that it might be well deliberate. So if you notice in figure number two, so this is, you look at the center and go up to that next figure, they look very similar to each other. If you notice, the little feathers on his head actually extend into the rim of the hypocephalus. They cross that line. Uh, this cosmic bisecting is prominent in Egyptian temples. Thus, in the temple of Opet, everything on the right side of the worshiper in the temple was on the south side, the side of light and life, while everything on the left side was north. Darkness and death between the two is the middle topos of the throne or sanctuary of the ruling god, which must always be exactly in the middle. This power in the center, a moon, is invoked in moments of distress when the man or god is in danger. It is the god who is summoned to the rescue on the hypocephali, who is Osiris. The situation is that of the lion couch, the Ra Osiris scenario, where Ra comes to, the re to rescue Osiris from the depths. The basic teaching of the alchemists is that indestructible spirit from above is united with indestructible matter, materia prima, from below into the indestructible body of the resurrection. Some really cool things that we can look at in there of how they break that down. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before. Uh, if you if you notice that, how those have gone up there, put that in the comments that you noticed that before. I'd never seen that before, but looking at it as I was going through the study, I found I realized that that it actually did extend over those lines, which is very symbolic because it's basically the only thing that goes over those lines. So most likely that was meant to be there. Now let's turn to the word J-O-E uh, that's in, in this uh, first, fi first figure. This, of course, suggests J-O-L, the angel who visits Abraham in the Apocalypse of Abraham and who is easily identified by George H. Box as Jehovah. So that's, that could be uh, figure one. If you remember, it was just looking here uh, to measure the earth, which is called Egyptian, J O E. So everything is measured by Jehovah. Jehovah is the standard. Everything gets measured by he is important. Now, what is that mysterious name, Jehovah, and its real form? The name was deliberately withheld from the world. Only one person was supposed to know it, and that was the high priest who whispered it only once when he entered the veil on the Day of Atonement. Its secret pronunciation was taught to the disciples of the doctors of the Jews only once every seven years. The form we all know in common use, Jehovah or Yahweh, is held by Jewish scholars to be only meant for the masses and not the true or real tetragrammaton at all. Necessarily, that must consist of four vowels, U-A-I-E, according to Eli Eliahu Rosh Pina. So fascinating that even that name is there, but they don't fully associate it. We're protecting the name of God, basically. Um, uh, fascinating on this as well, continuing on. He says here, It was in all accounts as Abraham offered sacrifice upon an altar, explanation of facsimile figure two, that he was overcome, remember, uh, that he was overcome with a horror of great darkness. Genesis 15, 12. And his spirit mounted up to the heavens to behold the theophany, the sight of God seated upon his throne in glory, and to be instructed in the mysteries of the cosmos. Almost the same thing happens to Moses in Joseph Smith's companion piece to the book of Abraham, as in other apocalypses like Enoch and Adam and so forth, where Moses, after being overwhelmed by Satan and knowing the bitterness of hell, as paralyzing fear overcame him, he was presently rescued and lifted up his eyes into heaven, being filled with the Holy Ghost. And calling upon the name of God, he beheld his glory again. So that's uh, uh, Shinobi's book, Abraham in Egypt, has that quote. Uh, so let's move on here and, and keep learning now. On some hypocephali, this figure is labeled both Ra and Amun-Ra, the same power at different levels. He stands at the zenith of the year, and at the noon of the day at his greatest moment of power. So this is, we're on, we're, we're on facts, or not to facts anyway, uh, figure number two. So the one at the top, basically right in the middle there at noon time, basically think of it as the clock. Uh, which is the sun, the ruler of the solar system, but everything about him reminds us that he is in motion. What about the rest of his journey passing through the underworld from the west to east? We are referred to the key, the Wepwawet, opener of the ways, which lets us out of the underworld. 
A most significant feature of figure two is the crown of the god figure, the crown the god figure is wearing, combining both ram's horns and the two tall feathers. It is the ta Chenon crown, which combines the double feathers of Amun's spiritual crown uh, with the ram's horns that, Ra, that bring Ra and Osiris together in a symbol of eternal beginning. The holy Egyptian feather which Shu wears signifies light traversing the space between heaven and earth and is represented by the god of that name. It is filaments symbolized the rays of the sun. It is the famous Atef crown designated by Joseph Smith as emblematical of the grand presency in heaven. And indeed, the two feathers are the prime emblems of celestial light and spirit. Significantly, the Shah feather is not a theological, but an astronomical symbol. As Rudolf Anthe sees it, the God's name is never written with the familiar divinity sign. Rather, it represents the actual sunshine or light and energy that traverses and fills the space between heaven and earth. A light, to quote Joseph Smith, pertaining to other planets, the sign of the two feathers enjoyed a very wide range of interpretation among the Egyptian scribes. Joseph Smith calls the staff that he's holding a key, or the key of powers, that, that staff he's got. The Hebrew word for key, uh, mipta, means literally opener, while the Egyptian name of the god who bears the staff is wupwawat, opener of the ways, the Egyptian obsession with the way as the course of life here and hereafter eloquently expressed in the first psalm and in the preaching of the great high priest Pet Petoceros, I will show you the way of life, has been discussed at length by scholars such as Oswald Spengler and Gertrude Thalsing. Peter is one who has the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 16, 19. Janus also is the god who holds a staff in his left and a key in his right, the one who holds the key, and the one who is the gatekeeper of the heavenly courts. The Egyptian is constantly concerned with being checked or blocked in his career. Only real power, the power of the key, can overcome his determined opponents. It shall become apparent that the key plays a major role both in the hypocephalus and in the prophet's interpretation of it. Now, a little bit more about the, the uh, feathers that he has up there. He says, his feathers usually touch and often protrude above the confining edge to show him, as one scholar puts it, here at the vertex of the universe, the ram comes first of all in order, appearing at the head of the universe and the beginning of light. He is, by all accounts, a true two-faced Janus figure. Classical writers, as we have seen, associated Amun's ram's horns with the constellation Aries, the ram, the opener of the year. So Aries is one of the first constellations that's coming up, usually the beginning of the year. So some fascinating things we get to see about that person in, in number two. So let's talk about his staff a little bit more. If you notice as he's holding a staff, there's a figure of an animal on top of that staff. That is the jackal or hunting dog. So this is uh, here, best known standard born by the king on the march is the Wep Wawet emblem of the jackal or hunting dog, okay, uh, who goes ahead of the host in strange terrain, sniffing out the way and scouting ahead. In this capacity, he is not the leader, but a dependent, specifically designated as the Sum Sabit, the follower or attendant of the bee. As the real leader, the bee cannot be reduced to a mere emblem of his upper Egyptian entourage. Never knew how much symbolism was in this, did you? Pretty crazy. So to the left of the standing two-headed god, the mighty name of this mighty god. Basically, see, if you look over just to the side of him, there's, there's uh, a vertical uh, explanation of his name. Uh, uh, Michael Rhodes in his BYU study says, Every god and goddess possessed a hidden or secret name. If anyone could find out this name, he would have power over the god or goddess. So this is something that they didn't let known very much. But uh, um, one of the gods, I'm trying to remember, uh, um, Ra, I believe it was, he secretly, he gave his name to a female goddess, a goddess, and she kind of betrayed him on it and, and uh, he lost his power. She could control him. So here what's interesting, yet it is clearly displayed in the important 17th chapter of the Book of the Dead. Uh, 
Here we see the sun on the horizon, but it is neither yesterday nor tomorrow. Ra Harkati is exactly at the point of leaving the underworld and moving to heaven. The same idea is expressed in facsimile 2, figure 2, the two-faced god that represents the sun at the zenith and symbolizes the joining together of Ra and Osiris. As for yesterday, that is Osiris. As for tomorrow, that is Ra. So kind of showing, you know, birth and death at the same time, or sunset, sunrise at the same time, the faces pointing the other directions. The two come together at only at the in, indefinable instant of time when the sun reverses its course from a southerly to northerly direction. The Egyptian text explains that this is indeed the combined oneness of Ra, who looks forward to the day with Osiris, who is looking back on it. At that moment, his two faces are on both worlds at once. And on some hypocephali, the figure is drawn with a double body as well. But it is only for an unthinkable instant, the passing of the time from past to future, the fatal paradox or the movement in which we are all living. So when you deal with past and present, or you know the past and the future, you're you're basically dealing with that paradox of coming through through the present. What we're doing now is going to move to the past. What we're about to do is the future, moving forward basically. And they put them right at the top at noon to show the beginning and the end, just like the beginning of the end of a clock is at the same moment. Beginning and the end come together at that same moment as well. Uh, the two-headed deity wearing the double plumbed crown of Amun with ram's horns mounted on it. On his shoulders are jackal heads, and he is holding the jackal's standard of Wepwawet. To his right is an altar with offerings on and around it. In most hypocephali, he is holding the ankh, or symbol of life, in his right hand. Also to his right is a line of hieroglyphics reading the name of this mighty god. P.J. de Horak considers this to be Amun-Ra, the, the two heads illustrating the hidden and mysterious power of Amun, combined with the visible luminous power of Ra. William Petrie agrees that it is Amun-Ra, but sees the two heads as representing the rising and setting sun. That the deity is a form of Amun is clear from the fact that he is wearing the double plume crown mentioned in chapter 162 of the Book of the Dead, but why he has jackal's heads on his shoulders and is holding a jackal standard is not so evident. The jackal is generally used as a symbol of Anubis and Wepwawet, both funerary gods, Anubis being specifically the god assigned to guide the dead through the afterworld to the throne of Osiris. Perhaps due to the funerary character of the hypocephalus, it was thought that Amun should also carry emblems indicative of his power over that realm as well. Again, we can compare here the significance ascribed to these characters by Joseph Smith where the hypocephalus depicts the two-headed deity holding the symbol of life or power over death, Joseph mentions holding the key of power. Where an altar is shown, Joseph identifies the principle of sacrifice upon an altar as revealed by God to Abraham. A hidden power seems to be associated with the name of the two-headed God, who probably serves as a guide for the dead to bring them into the presence of God. This might concur with Joseph's explanation that this figure stands next to Kolob, as a guide surely must do if, if, they, if he is going to be able to lead the dead to God. So he needs to stand next to him. Uh, that was Michael Rhodes' BOU Studies. And he nimbly said, in the first line of the hypocephalus book, Book of the Dead 162, but also at the very top of every hypocephalus, we see the Lord of the Two Tall Feathers, who is addressed as the Mighty Lion, while in the rim inscription, the suppliant appeals to the victorious bull for deliverance. So there's definitely a lot more uh, understanding here. That's probably in figure two. Now down here in figure two, uh, the, what, what Joseph Smith says about this is he says, this stands next to Kolob. So Kolob is the, is the one in the middle, figure one, remember? That is the main one there. We believe is Jesus Christ. Figure two stands next to Kolob, called by the Egyptians, Abolish which is the next grand governing creation near to the celestial or the place where God resides, holding the key of power also pertaining to other planets as revealed from God to Abraham as he offered sacrifice upon an altar which he had built unto the Lord. So that's figure two. So really figure one is more God the Father. Figure two is God the Son or Jehovah. Basically, they're both represented in here as well, these two figures. 
All right, now let's jump to figure three. This is a really fascinating one. Okay, figure three is just to the right. If you're looking at the hypocephalus uh, in that top corner about two o'clock, uh, as the, the clocks would go, basically. So there's, excuse me, definitely a structure in these. Now, figure three, the raw head, this is the hawk-headed raw with the sun disc on his head, seated in the solar bark. That's that. That's the boat, basically. On either side of him is an ujat eye. With his hand, in his hand, he holds the Wurswurz Wurs scepter, symbol of dominion. So you see him sitting there. He's got that scepter in his hand. And in front of him is an altar with a lotus blossom on it. So it's right there on there on the, the boat, right in front of him, right in front of the scepter. Ra, seated in his bark, represents the sun in its daily journey across the sky and symbolizes resurrection and rebirth. Since the sun was thought to die and be reborn each day, according to Egyptians, the lotus on the altar in front of him is also symbolic of rebirth and the rising sun. The Yujat eye was symbolic of light and protection, among other things. And you can see one on either side of him. There, it looks kind of like an eye with the little lines come down below it, a little curly behind it. Uh, and this is, and is thus not out of place in this context, because it's a symbol of light and protection. Here again, certain similarities may be detected in Joseph Smith's explanations, where we may identify a royally seated God holding the scepter of dominion. Joseph describes a God sitting on his throne clothed with power and authority. So let's look at that really quick. He says, Joseph Smith said, figure three is made to represent God sitting upon his throne, clothed with power and authority, with a crown of eternal light upon his head, representing also the grand key words of the holy priesthood as revealed to Adam in the Garden of Eden, as also to Seth, Noah, Melchizedek, Abraham, and to all whom the priesthood was revealed. So in here, we see God sitting on his throne with this, the power uh, representing the, a crown of eternal light above him. That's the sun symbol uh and then the key word so if you look right behind the god are some hieroglyphs and those are the grand key words there's three of them i believe they're there so joseph smith has us is not far off of what we would learn if we looked at this just from a pure egyptian standpoint so he says, uh, the sun disk on the god's head and the Yujat eye, symbolic of light protection, somewhat track in meaning, Joseph's mention of a crown of eternal light, also the grand key words of the holy priesthood. No explicit mention of resurrection imagery is made by Joseph Smith here or elsewhere in his explanations, but his entire discussion assumes an immortal perspective. So a lot we can learn here now. Um, because this is God sitting upon his throne, he's, you know, on the boat, which is moving. You can see the little oar sticking out the back. He is moving visibly through the heavens, of which the sun is a similitude. So again, this is like the sun moving, God moving through the heavens, uh, putting everything together there. Uh, something that's interesting about this it comes from the church historian's copy of the hypocephalus. In the church historian's office, there is an old pen and ink sketch of facsimile too. In this drawing, figure three is entirely missing, showing that that part of the document had been destroyed by the time the facsimile was printed in the Times and Seasons. Along with it was missing that part of the rim that frames the upper right-hand segment of the circle where the hieroglyphic text has been replaced by heretic characters taken from the, the Horror Book of Breathings. It is claimed that this document shows the condition of the hypocephalus when Reuben Headlock engraved it, and that figure three, missing at the time, was added by the engraver. However, a comparison of the Headlock version with other hypocephali readily shows that, when this copy was made, the ship, as we now see it, was still in place, or else whoever borrowed the boat and trimmings that filled panel three must have been inspired since they are exactly what should be there. Note that many other hypocephali show the same ship complex that we find in the Joseph Smith copy. The boat in the picture is identical with another piece of Joseph Smith papyrus named JSP-4, 
which accompanies chapter 101 of the Book of the Dead. It has been noted that the figure in the boat is facing the wrong way, to judge by the other hypocephali. But since this is the most varied of all scenes on the hypocephali, and since in some other well-drawn hypocephali, such as the British Museum 37330, the seated figure in the boat and the disc-crowned hawk are also facing to the right. One cannot be dogmatic. Moreover, by facing to the right, the figure preserves the direction of motion of the whole hypocephalus. The most important figures at the top of the hypocephalus are moving to the right, as are those in the bottom panels when the figure is reversed, so that the disc itself seems to be revolving. The next world is not only an upside-down world, but it is also naturally a reverse world. The words behind the figure say the ship of the god. We may accept the two wedge-out eyes that flank the god in the boat, often interpreted when shown together as the sun and moon. In the king's progress by ship, the wedge-out eye is as the eye of Horus overcomes the darkness both as sun and moon. The high point of, mis of the mystery drama, according to Joachim Spiegel, is fusion of the king's nature with the god of heaven, which takes place when his statue is crowned with the moon eye of the upper Egypt and the sun eye of lower Egypt. If anything, the moon is an even more obvious earnest of resurrection than the sun, renewing itself 12 times as fast and by perfectly visible stages. The big was scepter that the king holds stands for dominion, according to Raymond Faulkner, and for dominion lordship, according to Alan Gardner. In either case, it is the ultimate sign of power and authority. So really cool stuff that we get to learn in here. Probably a lot more than you ever thought of, you'd know from this, but a lot of neat things we get to see. Um, so here's something to kind of pull these three together. So we've talked about figure one, figure two, and figure three. We're going to kind of pull this together a little bit with some with how this flows, basically. So if figure one is nearest to the source of power, somewhere beyond the stars, and figure two is next in order, and figure five is the sun, what is figure three? It is a busy center of exchange, powerhouse and distribution center fairly seething with activity, no two combinations alike in the hypocephali, but all depicting exactly the same idea. In relation to figures one and two, it is one more step down conveying the same divine power at the sublunary level, for we are now on earth, as revealed to Adam in the Garden of Eden, as also to Seth, Noah, Melchizedek, Abraham, to all whom the priesthood was revealed. This is another descending line of power. The hypocephalus, like the first chapter of the book of Moses, not only gives us a glimpse of the heavens and puts the lowly human race in the picture and involves us all in the works of Abraham, a hologram to put man into his proper setting. Thus we see in figure three how all things represent a process, change, motion from one state or condition to another, constantly changing form but ever preserving identity which the Egyptians designated as, as hupro, it must be clearly understood that this term has nothing to do with, with metapsychosis, or transmigration of souls. As in the seven ages of man, the changes of form and appearance do not mean that the old identity is lost. On the contrary, the hupper is a voluntary change of form with the individual always in control and thus a heightened assertion of individual identity. It is not the loss, but the intensifying of the ego. The initiate can change his form to match his environment or stage of the journey, precisely because he is the master of the situation. The main purpose of transformation is to escape dangerous situations, which makes it a form of adaptive behavior to assure the continued existence of the individual under all circumstances. It is a kind of natural selection, the very opposite of transmigration. Now, the main activity in this panel on most hypocephali is the handing around of the wedge at eye. We go on with these seemingly endless permutations to indicate what a hive of activity figure three represents, a lively exchange of position and powers with a full display of power and authority, the grand key words of the holy priesthood being passed around 
here represented as visual symbols as we know it descended to Seth, Noah, Melchizedek, Abraham, to all whom the priesthood was revealed. So let's take a second and talk about these grand key words that, uh, that are there. The proper names exchanged here belong to the symbols of the mysteries, quote, used as liturgical passwords, unquote. Like the exchange of questions and responses, they were probably spoken in an undertone both by the priest and the initiand, perhaps at the foot of the altar or at the door of the holiest. These long non-Egyptian names include the leaf-lion-ram combination found on many hypocephali, including the Joseph Smith. The suppliant in grave danger appeals to the God, identifying himself by secret names known only to the two of them, confirming his status as an initiated one with a claim to divine assistance. Following the exchange of secret names, the healing instructions are forthcoming. So realizing that that secret name Everybody was given a secret name, and you're supposed to keep it sacred, except to be only used at a certain place. 